Just waiting for it to be official. Which I think it is. It's hard to tell, guys. We're learning this technology stuff, but it's hard to tell. Okay. <laughs> So hi everyone, uh, I'm Colleen, the Jessica Rigos Fellow for Whale and Dolphin Conservation, coming to you live again from Newport, Oregon, um, my home office here. Thanks for joining our third and final Orca Month Happy Hour event. Um, we have a lot happening next week for the last week of Orca Month. We have trivia on Tuesday, we're doing a film screening next Saturday, and then of course our last Whalecraft Wednesday um, so this will be our last Friday afternoon event, and we hope that you have been having fun joining us throughout the month um, for these chats, as well as getting your creative skills on with Whalecraft Wednesday. And don't forget to send us um, pictures and videos of those crafts if you've been making them. Um, we want to see your actions or your fails either way, uh, so send us some pictures and tag us. Uh, before we start today, we do want to take a moment just to recognize and honor today as Juneteenth, a day to both celebrate freedom and for us at WDC to reflect on how we can improve our organization and our work to be more inclusive and to connect more diverse voices with marine conservation. We also recognize that it's not enough to just reflect today, but that learning must be accompanied by action. So we're taking steps to improve as an organization and for more on that, you can see our post from earlier in today uh, where we did provide some more detail. Um, and as that vital work moves forward, so does our work to protect and recover at risk whale and dolphin populations, such as the southern resident orcas. We are a global advocacy organization that seeks to amaze people with the wonder of whales and dolphins, as well as inspire action for their protection. And Orca Action Month is all about, um, you know, a dedicated celebration of the Southern resident orcas to inspire people um, with how amazing this unique population is and to hopefully uh, inspire more people to take action to secure the recovery of the Southern residents and the habitat that supports both them and us. And really that starts with recovering their ecosystem. Um, you know, the home of the Southern residents is what supports them and the marine waters they live in, as well as the watersheds and rivers that provide them with the food that they need. So in addition to all the individual actions that we've been highlighting all month um, that can help orcas and help their ecosystem, we also wanted to look at businesses that are doing some of the work to protect water and salmon, because it really is a team effort. It comes down to both individual actions, um, businesses and companies that are doing good, and pushing for those broader policy changes to support recovery. So for our happy hour series, we focused on sustainable breweries here in the Pacific Northwest in the home of the Southern residents and in my home. Um, and here's my conversation with the founder of Hopworks Urban Brewing up in Portland. Okay, hey everybody, welcome back to Orca Happy Hour. Uh, my name is Colleen Weiler. I'm the Jessica Ricos Fellow for Whale and Dolphin Conservation. And I am joined today by Christian Edinger from Hopworks Urban Brewery in Portland. Cheers, thanks for having me. Hey, cheers. I have the uh, Hopworks Juicy Bear IPA. Wow, well, a land-based beer. I've got, land the water, beer. I've got the water-based beer, the upstream I, Salmon Safe IPA. Nice. Well, we've got, I mean, bears eat salmon too. So <laughs> we've got true. all this is covered today. Touche. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks for joining today to talk about orcas and salmon and beer. Um, it's June, so it's Orca Action Month. And usually during June, uh, we like to get out and join our communities around the Pacific Northwest to get together and talk about our endangered southern resident orcas um, and how they are connected to salmon and watersheds and the health of our rivers and ecosystems here in the Northwest. The Southern residents are an iconic species. They're really well known across the world um, and also happen to be one of the most endangered whale populations in the world. They really are, in my opinion, they're quintessential Pacific Northwest orcas. They hang out from British Columbia down to Northern California. And as we've said, Salmon is their main food source, so they're really reliant on this other iconic Pacific Northwest species. And during Orca Month, our goal is always to get out and share their story and find out how 
people and other groups and local businesses are working on protecting and restoring um, salmon in our watersheds and, and kind of helping to, to get that word and, and that action out there. Um, Hub Hopworks has really gone above and beyond for salmon and watersheds. You have these fantastic environmental stewardship programs, you do a lot of community engagement, and there's one that I really want to ask you about today uh, that it's a program I've been following for years and I really wanted to connect with Orca Month more directly um, is Salmon Safe. So Christian, you personally have been really involved with Salmon Safe. You're on the board. Hopworks has multiple locations that are Salmon Safe certified. You get hops from certified farms and you have the Salmon Safe IPA Festival. So first tell us what Salmon Safe is um, and what that means for, for Hub. Well, thanks, Colleen, for having me. Uh, super excited to be able to talk about kind of the cool relationship between beer and water and why salmon and, and why white orcas and whales and the whole, the whole watershed. Um, so I've been making beer for 25 years and started Hopworks as a way to make world-class beer as sustainably as possible. You know, beer has been used in some form for the last 9,000 years to gather people. Uh, and it was a paycheck for the Egyptians, but in a more modern sense, you know, it's really a great place to uh, to hang out and, and talk about the issues of the world and to, to come together. It's, it's an inclusive beverage, you know, versus some other beverages, maybe a little exclusive pinkies in the air, but, you know, beer is really has, has an amazing uh, ability to gather people. So Hopworks, my wife and I started it. Uh, 12 years ago, and we have 143 employees uh, pre-COVID, and uh, now we're down to about 10, but we're making our plans come back to life in a meaningful way with our our three pubs that we operate, plus the one that's operated at the airport. So, uh, and then we have a commercial brewery in the basement that makes uh, 10,000 barrels of beer that's primarily sourced from local salmon safe organic ingredients. So the way I like to talk about Salmon Safe is uh, basically gives uh, water a voice in beer and organics gives soil a voice in beer. So obviously very oversimplified, but I was invited to join Salmon Safe about three years ago. I kind of represent the the kooky, maybe out of 46, maybe on the younger end of the board. I'm the kooky um, marketing uh, forward entrepreneur on the board. You know, we've got people from the medical community, finance, uh, from the forestry space and all that. So I kind of, I come in with my own, uh, my own ideas and really learn a lot uh, from the board. And um, Salmon and the relationship to Hub has been really fun. Uh, you know, Salmon Safe is, a, is an eco label that can be applied to, uh, to developments or uh, large, uh, uh, large pieces of land, you know, whether you're a farm or a campus in the case of Nike or a high rise. Uh, there's a way to apply uh, salmon safe principles to your uh, landscape practices, farming practices, as well as your construction practices. So we offer accreditation to uh, builders like, say, Vulcan up in the Seattle area. You know, they're one of our big partners up there that uses our overlay to really mitigate the runoff, the uh, quality of the runoff by choosing the right types of systems and construction materials to make sure that they're being good stewards through their process. And then in the case of a hop farm, it would be a really uh, great, you know, uh, plan uh, in terms of what you can apply with pesticides and fertilizers, what kind of buffers you need around the land, mainly looking at the riparian environment around the farm and how what you're doing on the farm impacts the, the health of the, the, um, the waterways for fish. So essentially, uh, salmon can spawn and thrive. So a really neat, uh, a neat way for us as brewers to really pay homage and respect our number one ingredient, which is water. And Salmon Safe, as you mentioned, kind of brings together all of these different issues that do affect the health of watersheds and of salmon, like green building designs help to reduce um, stormwater and contaminants that are coming from stormwater that can impact salmon streams and, you know, uh, farms that are using good products or helping to support healthy habitat. Um, also contribute to helping salmon be healthier, which we love because it helps to feed southern resident orcas. So yep. we like salmon because that connects back to the orcas. Um, so what what led to your initial decision to, I mean, it, I think Hopworks was salmon safe before you got involved in the board. So 
it, yeah. uh, your Vancouver building from the get go was a certified location. So what yeah. was your decision to, to want to uh, go for the salmon safe label? It's, e it's easier to um, implement salmon safe principles in any overlay in the design phase. So if you have something in mind and you can, you know, put a week in the trenches, it saves in planning, it saves you two weeks in the field. So we were able to get the, the Vancouver plant certified because the the landlord and our contractor and lender they were um, they were amenable to my suggestions. Is like, hey, th this is let's use this as a pilot. You have 400 acres here. Let's use our little you know one acre parcel in this 8,000 square foot building to uh, to use these 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 salmon safe principles and see what happens and tell the story. And uh, you know they're a pretty conservative group, and but they talked them into it. And they kind of maybe I'm I'm as uh, hopefully as good a salesman on these ideas as as a as a brewer. So it came together, and they were they were willing to do it. And um, the returns, well, we're in a, a cool old quarry up there that was kind of built on runoff or you know uh, sediment from the Missoula floods, and re really kind of a, a neat area with a rich um, camas. Uh, Bulb history and the native tribes of Chinooks up there. So the Chinook, uh, really kind of a neat juxtaposition with ancient lands that happen to be uh, a great gathering place for uh, for Native Americans uh, uh, long ago. And uh, it worked and we've got that badge up there and, and we tell the story on our website and the labels and, and try just to have a, a real casual, we don't like to to be too um, forward with these. We kind of like to let people soak in the salmon safe ideas. What is this little badge you can see on our on our cans? We've got our little totem and at the bottom it says um, salmon safe certified brewery site. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> we, I, I think that we, we've got so much to talk about in terms of sustainability that, um, you know, we kind of like to walk softly. I'm cracking my beer open here. That's my favorite sound. Um, <laughs> We like to walk yes. softly because we got this B Corp overlay, which is you know essentially the umbrella under which we all operate, and that covers social and environmental issues. And we've been really focused for the first 10 years on the environmental side and the social side. Is, we're kind of late bloomers there, so it's neat to have uh, a, a spine uh, to attach things to over time as we make progress in, in the social area. In the environmental area, you know, we're early into organics, you know, from our outset. And we knew water was important. And so as we look at the brewery, Salmon Safe Brewery site really looks at um, primarily at the hardscapes and the, the softscapes on the brewery site so that our runoff, it's, you know, Salmon Safe in, in terms of a brewery site is about, uh, is about stormwater management. So <clears throat> when you look at a landscape plan, making sure you're in, in cahoots with your landscaper to make sure that the things that they may do in a typical site, they're not doing on your site. You know, you're, you're using drought tolerant native species for landscape. You're making sure there's no irrigation. You need some irrigation in the first year to get everything rooted in, but making sure there's, there's no irrigation system. You're making sure that they don't, they're not applying their typical uh, nitrogen rich fertilizers to the site. And, uh, and God forbid you even plant some pollinator gardens out of the, out of the, the gates, right? So that's kind of the landscape. And then you look at the, the, uh, the roof, uh, and making sure that there isn't any material up there. You know, we use a TPO roof up there, it's 10 kilowatts of solar, uh, but then the, the water that leaves the roof and that leaves the hardscape has an opportunity to infiltrate on site um, instead of a stormwater planter, which by code might only require to hold a 10 year event. These are required, you know, Salmon Safe would be beefed up so it can hold 25 year events and like, you know, a lot more water on site before it spills over into the, the street and goes into the, the, the sewage treatment system. So really it's about just kind of simple stuff, but you stack up a couple of these things and it becomes quite meaningful and a nice visual model because it's also pleasant to look at. Yeah, definitely green, green buildings and pollinating plants and all that stuff. And just having something that is friendlier for stormwater runoff uh, for people watching who might not be familiar with the terms 10 year and 20 year that refers to flood events. Um, we get a lot of rain here in the Pacific Northwest and a lot of contaminants come from runoff from buildings um, into stormwater. So having buildings that are built to kind of hold that water and withstand those really high flood events um, can help filter some of those contaminants out. And we were, we were talking before, um, you know, the, the concept of hub is a circle, everything, you know, the 
carbon cycle and cyclical elements of nature and kind of occurred to me, you know, you mentioned water is the source of beer. So you got to respect water. And then in improving your, uh, your buildings for stormwater runoff, you're also, you know, you're kind of, you're putting back in with respect to what you're, you're taking out. So yeah, recharging, right? All comes together. Yeah. And you touched on some of the other stewardship programs, both environmental and otherwise that Hub works on. So you guys definitely really walk the talk when it comes to that. Um, and Salmon Safe isn't your only environmental stewardship program. So can you give us a little more detail on, on what else you have going on for stewardship? Yeah, we have our, you know, we're also a member of 1% for the planet. So we take 1% of the top line sales, which is a neat kind of parlay into, um, you know, how, how we look at the, the different major elements of environmentalism. And we originally from our outset, we we're looking at, okay, 1% for the planet, let's get 24 different partners a year and have these gatherings twice a month at our pubs. And we end up being really busy, not moving the needle very much for a whole bunch of organizations. So we pulled that back and decided to develop three really cool uh, partnerships throughout the year to look at different systems, uh, different nonprofits uh, with, um, with a trimester seasonal program. So just like your, you've got Juicy Bear, we've got, um, which was, okay, now <laughs> I've been in COVID space for so long, I totally forgot about what normal operations look like. Uh, but uh, we've got Juicy Bear, we've got Totally Chill, and then in the fall, we've got Abominable, and essentially we'll work with, um, the let's say the next one coming out, Totally Chill, for instance, we partner with the Street Trust, to address global warming through the lens of alternative transportation. In the fall, we make a beer called Abominable, which is a Yeti and a really cool beer we've had in, uh, in the market for a while, India Red Ale. And that is, uh, we work with the Nature Conservancy during that trimester uh, through their October Forest Program to, uh, to really address uh, water issues through, um, with a partnership with Nature Conservancy where we can you know, it, and the, their October Forest program is really cool because it's an international uh, group of brewers that make Oktoberfest beer with the idea of, of partnering with the Nature Conservancy and further, the Nature Conservancy has a lot of different endeavors, but mm -hmm. one of which is, you know, healthy forests, healthy water. And so that's a really neat uh, program as well. And, uh, Brandy, what was our, our first trimester partner? I kind of remember. <laughs> Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, so the other uh, part was our first trimester. Again, I'm, I got COVID brain. Yeah. Just like, I've been thinking all, about budgets, and insane. this came out of my HR meeting, and I was like, ah, what is that first one? Yeah, so the first one, we we work with um, uh, Friends of the Trees with the beer uh, you're drinking right now. Uh, so we can coincide, basically, a f really cool beer release with an announcement of our partnership and then 1% of the, the beer sales for that, of the total beer sales, not pub sales, but the beer sales for that trimester go back to that nonprofit. And in concert, now we're talking about global, really it's kind of all mapping back to water and global warming, but uh, global warming in trimester one with the uh, Friends of the Trees, how we can affect global warming through carbon sequestration with tree planting and how can beer help propel that, you know? So it's really fun and a much more simple way of, of going about it than we were historically. So we can make a bigger difference for fewer partners that are um, really, really great, doing great work that we can just help propel with beer. Yeah, bringing it all back to beer and kind of helping to get the message out that way. Uh, yeah. And as you said at the beginning, like beer is a great way to get people together and talking. And then you add these extra elements to it and they maybe they start talking about um, you know, nature conservancy programs or, or global warming issues, then you get a conversation started, which is, which is really awesome. And all of those programs, um, as you said, are global, but definitely have real impacts in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, healthy forests and healthy watersheds are connected to salmon. Um, we're expected to have impacts from climate change here that can also really affect salmon. So it's it's all really Pacific Northwest oriented too. Sure. Um, and for Hub specifically, you guys are, you're in Portland. Um, you're in this really unique location just off the Columbia River, which is one of the biggest salmon rivers in the world and one of its biggest tributaries, the Willamette. Um, and that watershed used to be home to, to millions of salmon. 
They've declined for a lot of reasons, which has also impacted the orcas. They like to hang out right at the mouth of the Columbia in the, the winter and the early spring and wait for those spring Chinook runs to come back. Um, but has that location in Portland and being close to these major rivers influenced your approach at all in, in how you're doing some of these sustainability programs? Yeah, I always kind of go back to growing up in Portland, like, you know, why are we doing this? This is a lot of extra work and um, and it can seemingly be kind of dissociated from beer and small business. Like, why would you go through all this trouble? Well, you know, growing up in the in the Pacific Northwest, really growing up, I was born in San Francisco, but my folks moved up here uh, in the VW in, in 77. And um, my dad was an architect working for the Forest Service. So we were always kind of out in nature. He was designing ranger stations and outhouses and stuff like that. So we were out, just found ourselves in nature from day one in, in Northern California, but also moving up to Portland. You know, you, it's Oregon is such a beautiful state and growing up here, you know, from just recycling as a young, young person and getting a sense for, you know, going to the, the natural food store. I, I just wanted normal noodles and, and, and chocolate like my friends and sugar cereal. And I got I got all the bulk stuff with uh, spinach noodles, carob chips. I was like, <laughs> what is carob? Carob is not a good substitute for chocolate, by the way. But uh, no sugar cereal, just Cheerios, maybe Honey Nut Cheerios if I was a good kid. But we grew up here in the outdoors. And once you uh, marinate enough in the outdoors, you just, you got to make it your life's work to do what you can to protect it. So the confluence of the Willamette River and the the uh, the Columbia River at Kelly Point Park there is incredibly important historically. You know, salmon runs, obviously, uh, yeah. The, the salmon reported to be so thick you could walk across their backs uh, instead of using a bridge to get across the river. I mean, what an what an amazing resource. Um, and just doing, you know, my read. I just finished reading "Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee," and you know, and really enjoy reading and researching, you know, the Native American perspective and uh, and their connection with the land. And I always I always felt kind of like I was trying to model my behavior in the business after that growing up here, you want to protect it. It's beautiful. How do we use business as a force for good and beer as a force for good? And certainly water growing up here, swimming in the Willamette, you was never advised. And uh, it just embedded itself in my brain. I'm like, why is it not advised to get in this river that was a hundred years ago, crystal clear and laden with salmon? Like, why is that? And it turns out it's this crazy cocktail of, point source and non-point source pollution that's 100% controllable. <laughs> and so that's really kind of kickstarts you on the journey. And so as a kid, you, you just, you're out there in it and you want to protect it. And now I got an opportunity with the business to, uh, to really put our money where our mouth is and try not to talk so, so, to, so softly that you don't share the, the message, but you try not to be too heavy handed with it either, you know? Unfortunately, beer makes it easy to, to do both at the same time, you know. The ultimate social lubricant, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, as you said, I mean, I, I lived on the Willamette down in Corvallis for a while, and, you know, you kind of hear the same thing where it's like, don't get in the river, um, don't get in the river this month because we've had a lot of stormwater runoff and it's going to be really gross. But you, you do start thinking like, but this is, there's this beautiful natural resource and river right here in town like why can't we go out and enjoy it and have fun and recreate and look for salmon and, and do all that stuff so it, it gets you thinking but as you mentioned like growing up in the outdoors and just having that connection um it, it does make it I, I had the same experience so i guess maybe it makes it a little bit easier to to start thinking about those things and those issues um so when you are sharing that information with customers and and patrons do you find that the reaction is generally pretty good? Does it, does it vary between different people? Like what's, what's the general feedback then? Yeah, I think everybody's got their own kind of personal story and connection and, and the try and like, as I age, I try not to, you know, get, get mad about anything. I just try and understand like where people are coming from and meet them where they're at. Right. Some people yeah. love the, yeah. some people don't want to hear anything. Some people are fine with elevator pitch and some people just want to go deep. And I've got I've got a version of the story for everyone, <laughs> but uh, I think people are appreciative. You know, there's really for the people that get it, the early adopters and the true environmentalists. They're very you know they're very thankful and supportive of, of our business and, and thankful that we approach it the way we do. 
Uh, and then there's kind of the people that have heard about sustainability is around the tip of everybody's tongue these days, and they don't quite know why. But maybe starting to make some COVID connections where, you know, COVID cases were deepest is where air quality was the worst, you know. So it's really interesting. There's there's kind of a, a way to uh, get inside everybody's head in a thoughtful uh, in a thoughtful way to get them to at least consider uh, their purchasing behavior and its impact, you know. And so we we'll say, okay, vote with your dollar. What can you do every day with your dollar to make a difference? Because, you know, democracy is corrupted. Both sides of the aisle are taking handouts from corporations. Uh, why do we, we can participate in it? We just hand our ballots in today. And, you know, I hope it does something. But I know I'm far more powerful as a consumer. So uh, I think that people are appreciative. And there's other people are just kind of, hey, man, I want a beer. I want to have a good time. Uh, fortunately, my dad's an architect. We like design. And, and I'm really into the marketing and things. So I, I love labels and I love interior design. And, and and so we have a place that is really striking and comfortable to be in. So I think just as soon as people come in the four walls, they're like, oh, I like this place. And then we got more to offer as much as you want to take. We can give the information, but uh, we're trying to be, uh, we're trying to be, actually, we're, we're going to be a little more aggressive and heavy handed over time because uh, the clock's ticking and there's no time for uh, passive, uh, a passive approach to environmentalism anymore. So I'm, I think we're going to up our ante. We've got a new menu coming out, carved out a space for storytelling. I just uh, looked at our outline of our new website today, carving out a big area for storytelling about uh, our environmental endeavors and how people can make a difference. So uh, brave new world, and and we're we're excited about making a difference now. You know. And yeah, and sometimes it just starts with sharing that story and what yeah. you're doing and you can spark inspiration in somebody else to either ask you more about it and learn more or take steps on their own to start mm -hmm. doing the same. And we at, at WDC, we like to say that it takes a village to save a species and kind of combines all those elements that you were talking about. It's it's individual responsibility. Um, it's, you know, voting with your dollar. Where What are you spending your money on and where are you spending it? Then also pushing for those big policy changes that are really needed to help whales and dolphins and help watersheds and ecosystems and, and kind of support this this planet that we do share with with all kinds of other other living things. Mm -hmm. um, so creating that demand uh, both on an individual basis and from from policymakers is it all it all comes together for that. So. Sounds like you have some some good plans in the works to start um, kind of upping how you're sharing and reaching out to your community and, and customers with that information. Um, what what did you do before? What was the the prior approach to kind of sharing your your information? You know, I, I think that we, we kind of went on the crude uh, DIY path initially before we got uh, into the B Corp and 1% space. So we were just, you know, I printed out the lead for buildings template and uh, USDA organic guidelines. And we just kind of DIY'd our, our, uh, our construction project here on our 19,000 square foot building in our, our first brewery. And then um, we used um, the organic principles from the National Organic Program pre-2013. And uh, really started talking about organics from the outset, uh, proudly featured on our three beers. We had an organic lager, we had an organic IPA and a, a coffee stout that were all fully loaded with USDA information. And the web has been powerful. I think storytelling is great. You know, uh, the website has really been the tool lately. And I, I really, I think that now with the way we've refined our 1% for the planet giving and focused has been helpful. It's, it's easy to talk you know, too much about a wide variety of things and not make an impact. So we're really more focused over time and water is a huge focus for us being, again, the correlation is so obvious between uh, water is, you know, 93, 95% of beer. Uh, so efficiency and uh, uh, is, is a huge endeavor for us and as well as, you know, how do we treat the water properly on its way uh, before it leaves the building. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I really think that using the power of the web and social media and our partnerships is really how we're packaging it up now versus that kind of DIY approach of, of your days of your, I sound like an old Viking, you know, <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. 46. I've been doing this a long time, actually 25 years and man, how it's changed. It's so, it's so fun, the journey. And we're really positioned right now, I think to, um, to talk about it in a much more kind of inclusive and productive way. 
That's great. I love that. I'm looking forward to, to seeing the new information and everything. YouTube videos. That's yeah, yeah. Yeah. Videos are great. <laughs> videos yeah. are a fantastic way to connect with people and, and definitely um, easier than asking. I've, I've learned because I am, you know, a policy and science person. And so I will get into the weeds on details and information that I'm like, this is so great. And it's a lot and it's, it's a lot easier to put in a video that people are going to engage with rather than here's a list of things. But yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> do you think that, uh, you know, both as the DIY before and then in the future, does it help to make a connection to really iconic species, especially here in the Northwest, like salmon and like orcas, and make that, you know, point out how this beer, this process um, and salmon safe certification connects back to helping these famous and, and beloved species? Yeah, there's, there's some, the... I, I'm a big uh, kind of fan of of artwork and its place in beer, the labels. We spend a lot of time on those things, and we've noticed kind of this natural snap to our connection to. You know, so I'm looking at some of the labels to yeah. what we call yeah. kind of. I I, I had to I have interest like just growing up on mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. You know, it's like that. <laughs> I've got these images burned in my brain of you know. Uh, Jim wrestling an alligator while the commentator stood up in a tree uh, safely 300 yards away with the telephoto lens, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to, to get uh, good photos. And uh, so we, I'm looking at our cans back there. we got a really cool new lineup. So I call it Native Species of the Ring of Fire. And it's doing exactly that. It's using beer and the iconography that we can, we can kind of uh, animate uh, beer in some way, right? An inanimate thing. We can bring bring some some energy and life to it. So I'll, I'll kind of turn over here and grab some things off the window. So hopefully I won't rip my headphones out. No, uh, the artwork that goes into label designs is super intensive, and it's always really cool to see different. All right there, we go. My collection. So nice. I'll uh, I can talk about that just for a second. Hopefully this I wasn't fully prepared to do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I've got the Yeti, which nice. is a, myth, a mythical beast. You know, every culture has some sort of mythical beast, so they don't always have to be super realistic. This is the uh, Juicy Bear, what you're drinking. So clearly, yeah. you know, bears have a neat place in uh, in our environment. And, and in the heavens, there are some major and minor, right? We got the, the Hipster Yeti, which we were kind of, that was more for the Portland bicycle scene and all that. But then <laughs> our, our new favorites, this is my, one of my organic beers. This is... Uh, Golden Hammer. This is an organic, uh, USDA certified organic uh, lager. If you like Augustine or Hellas, uh, the monks in Munich are doing a great version of that. I've got an a organic uh, tree frog <laughs> with the psycho beer eyes. That's a fun one. I got an owl here, which, you know, so many great owls around. This is our flagship owl, the Owl IPA. Oh, wow. Um, and then I've got, you know, to, we do a fair amount of trade with Japan. Sapporo is our sister city, but we've got a, um, this cool uh, robot panda. So, you know, something Elon Musk might, you know, be proud of. <laughs> but uh, we have a lot of fun with the art and, and bringing some imagery to life uh, using, I like the idea of animating beer. And then this one is my favorite new one. This is the um, Upstream. Ooh. This is a uh, salmon safe IPA with our friends at Roy Farms up there in Yakima. There are 8,000 acres of salmon safe certified uh, a hop farm, 3,000 acres of hops, blueberries, cherries, and uh, I'm trying to remember what else is up there, but they're great friends and partners of ours as well. So using uh, those species, which are indicator species, this salmon is the, in, that's the canary in the coal mine up here. So uh, this one's the Yeti, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the Yeti, yeah, the Yeti is like, well, huh, I, I, everybody wants to see one or do they? Yeah. Well, maybe they're the ultimate indicator species because we never see them, so they might. Yeah. I just spent the week on the Mackenzie River, and I didn't see one, but I sure would have liked to have seen one. Uh, yeah, so there's a great connection between the species, too, and I think maybe those are, they can be fun, and then, like, in the case of the salmon, they can be super poignant and meaningful, and uh, it is ripe for exploration. So this is a tattoo artist, a friend of mine, Cheyenne Sawyer, he did that hand-drawn for us. Um, what an incredible power there is with great artwork to draw the eye in pictures with a thousand words. If you bring them with the eye and, and, and a, a great beer, and then the story becomes easy. You can't, the, the story, you go too deep right out of the gates, you're going to lose people. So I think there's a great power in bringing in the right animals to do some of the, the heavy lifting, you know? Definitely. And as you said, you know, 
art is a great way to bring people in. It catches their eye and they want to learn more and see what's that all about. And especially in the Northwest, like you put a salmon or a bear on anything and people are going to give it a second look. So they're like, oh, well, what's, I know that species. I love them. So what's that all about? And um, it's such a great, great way to kind of introduce people and, and get them interested. And definitely beer geeks here in the Northwest love a good label. So they're going to be caught on that and hopefully follow that pathway down to learning more about why that certain label is on the beer. So um, are people going to be able to find these awesome labels and awesome beers uh, widespread just here in the Northwest? Where do you guys, uh, where can people find some hub beer? Yeah, kind of, you know, we like to keep the carbon footprint low. So I'd say we, we drew a thousand mile radius around here, which sounds big, but you know, we're, we're always looking for ways to, you know, reduce our carbon footprint. So we said, okay, we'll draw that. Uh, primarily in Northwest, 80% of the beer we, we sell is in Oregon. And then 20% is surrounding states, you know, uh, Washington, a little bit Idaho, a little bit Montana, uh, go down to the Jefferson State, you know, Bay Area. We send uh, a truck a month down to that kind of LA and San Diego market to really, I think there's a kinship on the West Coast you know, mm -hmm. the best coast, they kind of got that. There's this, there's a, a continuity. I think certainly Jefferson State where the language is switched from uh, Spanish to Native American, Cascadia, we like to call it. So I really like looking at that, um, that area as, as a focus for us. And then we'll have a little fun on the West Coast where we think there's like-minded people and, and people that, that would appreciate our approach. You know, certainly this is that, you know, surf and skate and bike scene, Southern California, we think really works well for us. Um, mm -hmm. Colorado, we do just a little bit of sales in, in Denver, that mountain scene, really, they appreciate what we do. We make a beer for Patagonia uh, provisions. So Patagonia, you know, Yvonne Chouinard thought he could make uh, a, a bigger impact uh, on the planet uh, through the food system than through uh, maybe all the good work they've done in the, in the apparel side. He thought there was a great opportunity in food. So he's, he started a food company with Birgit Cameron and uh, they called us, you know, five years ago to make a beer for him. So we've got, we make two beers for Patagonia uh, that are made with a perennial wheatgrass called Kernsta. And uh, so we'll enter into some markets with them. Like we send it uh, to Southern California. That was the main reason we were down there was to sell that beer. And then a little bit over to Japan, the Japanese uh, culture just really appreciates the quality and environmentalism that, uh, Patagonia brings so it does really well over there and we sprinkle it in here and there certainly that was the reason to go to Colorado but you know to how flattering for our small little family company to get the call from Patagonia hey we we know you guys appreciate the planet and organics the way we do organics is a minimum gating item for anything they sell and could you make us a couple beers and I was like a pinch me moment I'm like I'm like yeah right this is Yvonne Chouinard on the phone. No, it wasn't him. It was Burgess. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's it's uh, it's really fun to, to um, have doors like that open, like not unlike the call from from you and the opportunity to speak to you about you know what we're doing and how it, how maybe we're in a small way helping uh, to improve the riparian uh, habitat for salmon. So those so what I've read is you know an orca requires eighteen to twenty five salmon a day you know, per, per, per whale to survive and, and thrive. And hopefully in some way, the beer that we're making is, is helping to secure that, that food supply for these wonderful, wonderful animals. It's definitely on, on the helping side, like there's, it's uh, whatever we can do to help rivers and salmon um, ultimately have, have such wide ecosystem impacts all the way out to orcas. So that's great. And we love Patagonia. Um, they support a lot of our work. So it's really great to hear that, that you guys are involved in that too. Are, um, are the beers carried in Patagonia stores just locally or, or around the U.S.? Well, due to the conservative nature of alcohol um, uh, regulations in the U.S., they, can't, they, they, have, they cannot sell them at their, their stores. So Got sell it. them at, at adjacent grocery stores. And in Japan, however, where the laws are a little more relaxed, they can they sell the beer in, in the Japanese uh, Patagon, the 25 stores in Japan. They can sell it direct to consumer there. Uh, so it's it's been an interesting challenge there in terms of access. But uh, the message around the um, the perennial wheatgrass kerns that they're using, which was developed by the Land Institute, is just an incredible story for those that like to go a little deeper in that there's a great video on their on their website go to patagonia website and find out about their food and their approach to food is just 
incredible what they're doing in the food system. Uh, yeah, so awesome opportunity yet again to, to change the world and tell a story through beer. Tell a story through beer and then business is doing good, which we always like to hear and like to send people their way <laughs> again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it sounds like if you're on the West Coast, you might have a pretty good chance of finding some hub beer. So take a look around you. Uh, if you're in Colorado, even take a look. If you're elsewhere, um, check out their website and order some cool t-shirts or something because you can still you can still rock some good artwork even if you're not enjoying a beverage. Yeah, there you go. A little organic cotton there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so speaking of website and people enjoying some, some good beers at home, you guys have instructions on your website about throwing a green kegger, which I thought was hilarious and great advice for some college towns or maybe some, some summer socially distant barbecues. Um, so do you have any other tips for how people can enjoy beer sustainably, responsibly, of course, but also sustainably uh, when they're at home? Yeah, God, I know the whole COVID thing has had us, you know, our, our delivery and dock sale has been going bonkers. Uh, people have been really enjoying a lot of beer lately. So we're, we're, we're grateful for that. But, um, you know, certainly I think that buying, um, using your dollar to, to support local is a huge thing you can do. Reducing the carbon footprint associated with moving that beer around uh, is just awesome. Uh, looking for those eco labels, you know, if, there aren't many organic beers out there, but, uh, you know, if you can find an organic beer, I look to that as well. Uh, make sure the ownership structure of the company is, is set up properly that you're not sending money out of the country, uh, with, you know, unknowingly to, to, uh, further deforestation or some crazy, uh, uh, you know, social experiment somewhere in the world that may or may not be going well. So, uh, I think the, the, the beer, I think the power of beer is also looking at the containers it comes in, you know, the recyclability, uh, municipal recycling streams treat different containers differently, you know, so you might have a higher likelihood of having an aluminum can recycled than a glass container. Uh, we're in Portland, so our Portland bottles are made over by the Portland airport off of 65% uh, curbside recycled glass. So we're really fortunate in Oregon, uh, what we're able to, um, use, but also the cans have a neat advantage. I really, you know, not to, to go down that wormhole, but I will for a second. The can's 30% lighter than glass. So if it is transported, you know, it's gonna burn 30% less fuel moving it to the market. And cans are 100% more likely to be recycled in the US than glass. Uh, glass has some neat attributes. Some of our friends uh, in Oregon are using some reusable, uh, returnable glass, which uh, is great in some ways. and maybe have to travel a little farther in other ways. So it's kind of those whack-a-mole thing, you know, it's like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm buying local, but I might be, you know, not buying, uh, who knows where their ingredients are come, come from or uh, what the ownership structure is looking like. But family companies, my wife and I are the only stakeholders in our whole company. So buy local, buy from family companies, you know, cans are cool. Uh, and certainly look for any of those eco labels, like some salmon safe, some organic, uh, even B Corp is a neat uh, uh, thing that a couple of breweries that may not be doing organic have made, are making a great impact by, by being a B Corp versus looking at specific um, <clears throat> eco labels around ingredients. Yeah. Yeah. And so for people at home, like if you have a favorite local brewery you like to go to, check out their website, look for all that information that Christian mentioned. You can't find it, email them and ask them. Um, and if you want to direct them to a good example of how they could maybe improve their practices, send them over to Hopper's Urban Brewery website and encourage them to check out what they're doing. Um, and just, you know, again, speaking up, voting with your dollar. If something is not doing what you want them to do, you can always ask for more information and, and tell them why it's important to you. So, you know, getting the, getting the ball rolling and, and getting things moving. I think always, always a good thing to start that conversation. Yeah, yep, yeah. exactly. All right, so you're drinking uh, some Salmon Safe beer today. Is that your favorite Hub Salmon Safe beer? Have you guys done some before that um, that are also pretty good? What's the, what number is this in the lineup? Well, yeah, right now this is my favorite for sure. Uh, from the artwork, just being my, my buddy did the, the label and uh, the, our, our wonderful partnership with Roy Farms up there in Yakima, it's like, it's very meaningful and beautiful and, and, and delicious. 
um, you know, I joke that, you know, my favorite beer is the one in my hand, right? Because, you know, <laughs> for people that drink beer with, with the frequency I do, you know, I think that uh, it's a lot of it's about the situation you're in. Like just this last weekend, I was, you know, camping and mountain biking on the Mackenzie River down one of the most pristine waterways in Oregon and, uh, and drinking these beers. And it just, it all comes together, you know, drinking the right beer in the right place and getting out there in the environment and appreciate it. You know, we've got a nice summer just starting here and really excited about, you know, uh, to, about spring spreading you know the beer around uh, and then and, and enjoying this wonderful environment that we need to work so hard to protect around uh around the world we've traveled a lot around the world too and i tell you you know coming back home what we got here is every bit as beautiful as any other place we've been in the world so it just gives us focus to like continue to st keep it local focus our our energy where we can make an immediate difference in the willamette river you know essentially this little watershed we got you know, Columbia River drains a lot of land. If I can just, I, I kind of a cool little story. So one of my elders on the Salmon Safe Board, he just retired from the board, Peter. Uh, he, he just, uh, I asked him, I said, hey, Peter, I'm 46. I got a lot of, a lot of energy. Uh, what do you want me to do? You know, you're retiring. What can I do? What's, your, what's the legacy? What can I do? He goes, he goes, Christian, tear out those damn, those damn dams, the last three on the Snake River, the lower three. So Four. now... I got, a, yeah, the lower four, right? But he, he was like, he's like, Christian, if you can do one thing, just uh, get those dams torn out. So I got to endeavor, you know, I thought I had three, but now I got four to do. So yeah. somehow in the next 30 years, uh, I think I'm going to continue to to use beer to try and put a zipper down those dams and get them opened up. And uh, that, what, a, what a neat uh, epitaph for me as a, as a funky little brewer in Southeast Portland to, to use the power of beer to tear out some, some, uh, some dams that are certainly, yeah. certainly, uh, in need of, 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 uh, destruction, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's, um, there's a, we're part of a lot of different groups working on, on that particular issue, uh, and, and so bringing the Orca voices into that conversation yeah. and, you know, maybe bringing in some breweries and some businesses, it, it helps to have as many voices as possible and as many diverse voices as possible. Um, talking about the benefits of a restored and a healthy Snake River versus what we have now. So, yeah, we <laughs> welcome to the fold. We'd love to have uh, to have more voices into the, into that conversation. Yeah, I want to make a beer just for that. Like, how could we have a permanent beer that was just all about pulling those dams out? I mean, as you work your way up the Snake and the Columbia, I mean, yeah, the number of dams is astounding. Yeah. And I was like, where do you start? Well, I guess pick the closest one. <laughs> but, but the Snake <laughs> well, seems to be the, the Snake seems to be the logical, the logical choice, right? Yeah, I mean, we could do we could do another hour of webinar talking about the Snake River and how much restoration potential is there and how important those salmon are to feeding southern resident orcas. Um, you know, Snake River salmon are huge and fatty and really nutritious and are just hanging on by a thread right now. So taking those dams out um, would certainly go a long way in helping Snake River salmon come back to healthy numbers, and that helps provide a lot of really important food for Southern resident workers. So it's on it's on our dream list. Uh, we've been working on it for a while, and and we hope we hope that we see that sooner rather than later too. So all right, let's get started. I'm, I'll drink to that. Yeah, <laughs> cheers to that. <laughs> cheers. All right, Christian. Well, the the theme of this year's Orca Action Month, we do a different theme every year, is Orca Love. So tell us one thing that you love about orcas. I'd have to say, without a doubt, I love orcas curiosity. That intelligence curiosity, just watching Jacques Cousteau, and I had a chance to meet Jean-Michel Cousteau in town. He was keynoting uh, a festival we had a couple years ago in our neighborhood. And uh, I've just been fascinated with the undersea uh, environment my whole life and had the good fortune of also being able to go to the Galapagos this last year and seeing what the ultimate in uh, environmental protection and preservation can do to uh, to a, a, the aquatic environment and uh, or not do really by by default and uh, it's we got a lot of work to do but the that protect that curiosity and uh, the, the orcas the planet will take care of itself if we just 
give it a second to breathe and uh, and to recover. So we're going to use use a lot of beer to help make that happen. But uh, yeah, I love the Orcas Curiosity because I really feel like I that really feeds my my fires. Continually be curious. Don't act like you know it all. Ask a lot of questions and vote vote with your dollar and your behavior to to change the world. Awesome. Yeah, we uh, orcas are so similar to us and, and people sometimes don't realize that, but keeping that curiosity and that intelligence and seeing how it mirrors in humans um, is a great way to, to connect with them and think about these larger issues. So it's great. Yeah, well, we appreciate what you guys do and they, thank you so much for having us on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Joining us, uh, thanks for telling us all the great stuff that Hoverx is doing. Um, and thanks for doing it. We, you know, again, voting with your dollar and supporting local businesses that are doing good things. Um, fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, I'm back. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed that really fascinating conversation with Christian. I had a great time talking to him. Um, and I think we ended it on such a good note talking about how resilient nature is and how it can bounce back um, if we just give it a chance. Actions all the way upstream can have a huge difference for watershed health and salmon and orcas. And we also talked about you know, the connections between social and environmental issues and how businesses and the environment are not mutually exclusive. Um, and so some of our Orca Month actions like being a responsible recycler, and um, planting local, we covered all that as well, and rain gardens and, and all kinds of good stuff in our talk. So, um, you know, to wrap things up, uh, Christian had a really good point of voting with your dollar. So looking into the businesses that you frequent and you support and finding out what their sustainability measures are um, and asking them for more information or letting them know that it's important to you and getting them to step up and play a role in, in watershed and ecosystem health as well. Um, if you were amazed by that artwork that Christian showed us, uh, Hopworks was very generous and donated a t-shirt as a prize for Orca Trivia, which is coming up next week. Um, so if you want to win some really cool artwork from Hub, play trivia, join us, could win. Um, next week is the last week of Orca Action Month, but that you know doesn't mean that action stops. We won't stop with our work to protect and recover the Southern resident orcas. Um, we just won't have weekly whale craft Wednesdays anymore, but <laughs> the work goes on and we hope that you join us um, both for events next week and for everything Southern Resident in the future. Um, any of the 30 days of action that we've been talking about and kind of, you know, uh, supporting all through Orca Action Month, both with WDC on whales.org and with the coalition Orca Salmon Alliance and orcamonth.com. Those actions don't have to be limited to June to Orca Month. You can take them at any time um, and they help the environment and Southern resident orcas and all whales and dolphins. And if you are joining us, don't forget to take pictures, um, post, upload, tag us, use the hashtags Orca Month, hashtag Orca Love, hashtag Orca Hero so that we can see all the great work that you guys are doing um, and help bring that community together around Southern resident orcas. So. That's it for today. Thanks for joining for our last Orca Month happy hour and happy Orca Action Month, everybody. And we will see you on Wednesday for our next craft. Um, or on Monday, there's a really cool webinar happening with our friends at Orca Network. So find out details on that at orcamonth.com. Okay, goodbye, everybody.